All right. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jasmine Navarez, Digital Content Coordinator here at Simulations Plus. Dilly Sim Services President Brett Powell will introduce our speakers for today. In this webinar, our experts will share details and demonstrations of advances that increase the efficiency with which simulations can be performed in NAFLSTIM and improve the user experience. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. By attending this event or participating in the Q&A session, you are allowing us to contact you for follow-up. You may ask questions via the questions panel on your dashboard at any time. And then we'll also address all the questions in the Q&A after the presentation. Uh, take it away, Brett. All right, thank you, Jasmine. Um, hello and everybody, and welcome to the NAFLTIM V2B beta uh, release Tech Talk webinar. Uh, my name is Brett Howell, and I lead the Dilly Sim Services Division of Simulations Plus. Um, and we are excited today to, uh, to have a chat, a discussion around this new release. We at Simulations Plus focus on improving health through innovative solutions. Uh, and we do that through an expertise in quantitative systems pharmacology and toxicology modeling, which will be the focus of our talk today, but also through PVPK modeling, PKPD modeling, clinical pharmacology expertise, regulatory consulting expertise, with very well-known products in the field, such as Gastro Plus, the Monolix Suite, AdMet Predictor, and of course, the subject of our webinar today, the NAFLD Sim platform. So today we will discuss the improvement of health in the NAFLD and NASH field through the release of a whole new software environment and interface for our NAFLD Sim simulation tool. Now, I think you'll see that this improvement uh, is focused on efficiency, it's focused on user experience, it's going to be exciting to look at and, and, and think about some of these new features, um, and hopefully some of you will come away inspired to try it out. Um, so let me introduce our panelists for today. I've got a number of colleagues and friends joining me here today. First of all, I've got Scott Seiler, the Chief Scientific Officer of the Dilly Sim Services Group at Simulations Plus. Um, Scott is not only an expert in metabolic diseases such, such as NAFLD and NASH, but he's also the architect of the platform and really the lead of the, the scientific components of the platform. Um, we've got Francisco Wizar with us today. Uh, Francisco has joined Simulations Plus not that long ago as a scientist. Um, he's got sort of a unique perspective as a new user and tester of the platform, so we're looking forward to hearing from Francisco today on that. Um, we've got Matt McDaniel, who is a scientist with the team doing QSP and QST modeling, but also um, the lead engineer on implementing this Julia version of NAFLD Sim. And so, and also connecting that Julia um, infrastructure up to the QT C front end interface that you'll see today which I think you'll find quite interesting um, and fantastic. So Matt will be taking us through a demo today and showing us some features. And last but not least, we've got our senior software engineer, Cor engineer Corey Berry, who um, has architected that very QT interface that Matt will be showing, which is not only used for NAFLD Sim, but also for our Dilly Sim version X platform and other platforms to come. And so we'll hear from Corey on some of the engineering aspects of this as well. So. All right, um, let's get into it. Let's start with you, Scott. Um, you know, I think first things first, can you just orient our audience to what NAFLD Sim entails scientifically and what is it used for, just for those who may be less familiar? It would be my pleasure to do so. Thank you, Brett. <clears throat> so I'm now sharing my screen and you should all be able to see um, kind of the introduction, if you will, to NAFLD Sim. I promise I, well, I would love to go on and on about it. I'll keep it brief. Um, so let's first talk about the disease, because really this is what this is about, is making sure that patients who need um, appropriate treatment can get them. And in this particular instance, non-alcoholic state hepatitis, or it's kind of um, uh, less invasive, if you will, cousin uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, <clears throat> it's a progressive disease of the liver. So patients kind of progress along the spectrum where wherein steatosis or excessive amounts of lipid manifest ultimately to injury to the liver and fibrosis. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, uh, certainly a, a poor quality of life and uh, mortality rates that increase. And so um, there aren't many treatment options currently available, despite the fact that there are numerous such patients with NAFLD and NASH. 
the industry, um, the farm industry has recognized uh, this need and there's been a tremendous amount of development uh, aimed towards developing new treatments for NAFLD NASH. I will also probably, it's fair to point out, it's been a bit of a bumpy road. Um, lots of promising candidates that have not yet made it to the uh, finish line, i.e. available to patients on market. Still lots uh, of activity uh, as we hopefully get uh, relatively close to that. This is an ideal scenario, really. Um, so many different potential treatments and so much uncertainty to apply a quantitative systems pharmacology model such as NAFLDSIM. So we've developed uh, NAFLDSIM V2A, and now you're going to hear as of today about NAFLDSIM V2B. And really um, the focus here is on some of these key pathophysiologic mechanisms. And uh, equally as important, the mechanistic or pathophysiologic diversity of the NASH and NAFLD uh, patient population that is also captured within uh, our NAFLD SIM platform. Um, we, we, I'll, I'll uh, continue to elaborate. Um, we have a fair amount of experience at this point. I think uh, applying it numerous different ways, some of these are described here, certainly mm -hmm. as is the case with almost all QSP projects. Um, we are combining and really the intersection of pharmacokinetics, the mechanisms of action, and the patient pathophysiology to predict the efficacy of novel treatments. Um, the way that we've designed the model has some flexibility because new treatments, new modalities, new targets are always being discovered. And so we allow for uh, adjustments to the equations, adjustments to the representation to accommodate new targets such as this in this sort of scenario. Um, we've had plenty of experience in particular optimizing clinical trial protocols throughout the pipeline, um, various durations, you know, be it 12 weeks, be it 24 weeks, be it a year longer. Um, <clears throat> we've also um, really used it to understand better uh, mechanistically what could be happening um, as these treatments are being applied <clears throat> to really improve in patients in vivo, uh, as well as and I think this is a, one of the sweet spots in particular for QSP modeling, combinations of treatments and um, two different mechanisms. Do they play well together? When and where do they intersect? Do you get an additive quality? Do you have one canceling each other out? Those are the sorts of questions QSP is really good at answering from a mechanistic point of view. And we have a fair amount of experience doing that with NAFLDSIM. And then also kind of unique, I think, to some extent in the NAFLD NASH area is there has been a uh, a challenging uh, frequency of patients on placebo uh, in the placebo cohorts with high response frequencies. And that is really making it challenging to establish that any given treatment actually has efficacy. And so we've applied some uh, simulations towards helping understand mechanistically how that might be happening as well. Um, we've worked with several companies, those with whom we've publicly presented, include Pfizer, Gilead, Genentech, BMS. Certainly there are others as well. I think at this point, the total tally of compounds and or targets is well in excess of 25. Um, and a, a number, of, like I said, a number of other programs in addition to those listed here. Um, and so we've been trying to get the word out, uh, numerous posters, presentations along the way at various conferences. We also have a nice uh, summary publication as well. And um, we uh, would be delighted if you would uh, access and, and review. So uh, just, you know, again, without taking too much time, I'll just kind of point out, here are some, uh, some a, a bit more deep dive into NAFLDSIM itself. The primary mechanisms of the disease are captured here, kind of color-coded for your convenience. Those in white deal with the, the lipid burden uh, upon, or kind of the steatosis submodel, if you will, uh, within NAFLDSIM. That which is in red is really the lipotoxicity, so the, the driving force of excessive lipids to cause cell death, apoptosis primarily. In blue is the inflammation component. So cells like macrophages, neutrophils get ramped up in this context of the lipotoxicity and cell death and release various mediators, many of which are pro-fibrotic. And that gives us, leads us to the green section of the diagram um, where the stellate cells make collagen and ultimately kind of um, that chronic disease condition leads to that fibrosis state. One of the interesting aspects of this disease is, um, and is the case with almost all fibrotic diseases, is it's a really slow time course. 
And so our simulations have to accommodate long time scales. We'll come back to that when we begin talking about the um, re recreating this model within Julia. This is all based on clinical data. So these are uh, targeted towards the equations, the parameters, towards humans, towards patients with NASH. Um, again, we have a diverse array of simulated patients, what we would call simulated populations or SIMPOPs that, that uh, account for the pathophysiologic and clinical heterogeneity. And again, a number of ways this has been applied, especially simulating clinical trials. So with that, I think I'll stop here again. I would love to keep going, but I think uh, we need to learn more about Naples and Julia. So back to you, Brett. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, that was an excellent introduction. Uh, I think it gives our audience a good lay of the land. Um, just, a, just a couple more questions, Scott, for you. So in the process of testing um, this new version, what most excites you about it compared to version 2A? Yeah, that's a, a, well, that's an easy one to answer. So again, the, the computational efficiency with which Julia operates allows us to perform, conduct these simulations with greater speed. Um, and in particular, add that to the fact that this area of NASH, our global understanding of the disease, is ever increasing, which means we're having to generate new simulated patients that capture specific aspects of the pathophysiology that are just being discovered in real time. So being able to use this increased simulation speed paired with our understanding of what's happening as it grows allows us to increase our and the validity of and the number of simulated patients that we can generate. All right. Well, one last question for you, and I'll let you off the hook, Scott. Um, are there any scientific updates in V2B beta, or is it just the uh, sort of environment and the tech that's upgraded? Great question. The vast majority is on, on, the, on the software side, on the tech. There are, um, as I said, just alluded to, right, some learnings in real time. And specifically, we've included some aspects related to the fibrosis and the collagen turnover within some of our existing SIMPOPS patients within Naflitzim V2B. Great. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, let's turn over to uh, Francisco. Uh, Francisco, again, a great Again, great to talk to you today. Now, you represent somewhat of a unique test case for this new platform. Um, can you give our audience a better sense of your background with Simulations Plus and with QSP in general, sort of where you're coming into this testing and use process? Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to give a little bit more information about my background. So I was traditionally trained in computational mathematics and statistics. Uh, with a good portion of my work focusing on quantitative systems biology. Um, some of the work focused specifically on ion channels and calcium signaling in the context of oncology and development. So I came in not initially with a strong background in NAFLD or NASH. Um, however, at the core work of what I was trained in was how do we simulate biological systems and outcomes using mathematical representations of the physiological systems? Um, so getting deep into, you know, what is QSP? How do we use these equations to, um, you know, simulate these diseases and these outcomes that we're looking at? Um, so I believe that's, you know, where this unique test case comes in of, I have a good experience in the underlying framework of how do we use computational models to understand diseases and pathophysiologies, um, but not necessarily top the line expertise in NAFLD and NASH, you know, as other members of our team. Great. Well, you've been a, a, a tester, a new user for this. Um, how's that experience been for you testing and, and, and sort of working with V2B beta? So I think given the context of my background, the overall approach that I felt was uh, the testing V2B beta. Uh, it's very straightforward and streamlined. Um, so for, you know, my testing purposes, my goal was to implement, you know, here's this new test treatment drug X, we want to implement it into the base NAFLD equations of NAFLD-SIM V2P beta. And how does that implemented treatment change the different NAFLD clinical measures, um, NAS score, stage of fibrosis, different inflammation or fibrosis biomarkers. Um, and as you know, a kind of pre-training kind of thing, I had implemented the same treatment in V2A. Um, so I had some experience of, you know, this is what at least the outcome should look like using the same exact treatment, um, just being implemented in B2B. 
Um, but I think overall, you know, as I mentioned, you know, it's very straightforward to shift into um, V2B beta. I'd say one of the more streamlined things I did enjoy um, implementing in V2B beta was just the model updating process um, using what's called the data model builder. Um, and that's new to V2B beta. And I just felt it was a lot easier to add, you know, new parameters new state variables and algebraic equations. Um, it's all simplified in one little interface that's um, yeah, a, a easier to like, okay, you know, these are all the things I need to, you know, go one by one down the list to get done to update the full model. And you feel like new users, based on your experience, other new users, you think they'll pick it up relatively quickly? Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel anybody that's experienced with V2A will easily pick up V2B. Um, be able to hit the ground running with their simulations. Um, but even on top of that, I think even new users without prior experience in Napled Sim in general, like myself, when I first started, you know, they'll still be able to quickly pick up and use V2B beta um, after doing some run through of implementing their own test case scenarios and just getting a feel for the process itself. Any, any concise tips for, for those folks as they're looking to make that transition that you, you know, want to little nuggets you want to give or share? Yeah. So I, I'd say my biggest tip was, would just to be start small and implement updates iteratively. Um, and don't just, you know, push one large update at once. You know, it's a lot easier to troubleshoot and find, um, you know, which chain and the links that I built or yeah, breaks if you're just going one chain at a time versus doing the whole process at once. Um, and additionally, I think on top of that, another good thing I would advise is take some time to explore the new interface of V2B. Um, that's going to go a long way in setting up your first simulations, you know, just navigating what are the inputs and what are the outputs um, to be able to create the model that you actually um, want and need from V2B beta. All right. Well, great. Thanks, Francisco. That's a fantastic perspective. Let's turn over to Matt McDaniel. Um, Matt. Why was Julia chosen for V2B as the back end sort of implementation? Well, as, uh, as Scott mentioned, a lot of the models is on a very large time scale. Um, and so that can make for some very stiff equations. And so the most natural way to speed up that computation would be to use a more statically typed language like C, which is what we did do for DillySim. Um, the issue with that, though, is that a dynamic language more like MATLAB or Julia fits our needs better because that lets us keep the model equations and parameters open so that users can edit the model and the, the equations and you know, explore and experiment with it. And so uh, Julia is a dynamic language, but it has what's called a just-in-time compiler. Um, so it only compiles the code it absolutely needs and they've optimized it to reduce the compile time performance hit you get with something like MATLAB. Um, the designers designed it with an eye towards numerical computing, um, but it can be used for more general software applications too, whereas MATLAB is kind of pinned into really numerical applications. Um, the, the multiple dispatch strategy they have, again, that's another compiler optimization method they use that really makes things a lot faster. And then for us, uh, a great application was Julia gives you the ability to save pre-compiled code in a system image. And so what we've been able to do is we create a system image with all of the NAFLD sim engineering code pre-compiled, and then we can ship that alongside these files with our model equations that are compiled at runtime. So instead of compiling everything, every single run, it's only the equations being compiled, everything else is already ready to go. And then, and also Julia's got a very robust, um, user community. Um, they're developing new packages and updating it uh, very frequently. In particular, the differential equations library um, has just had a, a massive amount of user contributions to it. And it's, it's gotten uh, really good over the last couple of years. So those were a lot of the factors in, in choosing Julia for our, our, our back end. That's great. Yeah. So um, what about command line use? You know, the graphical interface is really nice, as we'll see, but um, for, for a lot of our users, that's not, not so important. So is there a command line option available? 
There is a command line option available. Um, it's, it ships right alongside the, there's a Nappleton GUI executable and a Nappleton CLI executable that can be used. Uh, and, and Corey also developed a command line launcher GUI. And what that is, is it is a, a GUI that walks you through, you know, the command line arguments um, that, you, that are required and what the options are for. And so if you're a user who's more GUI oriented and you're trying to make the transition to more command line, that's a really nice intermediate way to start learning how to use the command line features. Awesome. Well, uh, Matt, why don't you walk our audience through a little demonstration of the new tool, sort of show it off and, and give them a feel for it if you don't mind. All right, sounds good. All right, so you should be able to see the Napled Sim home screen right now. And so I will just point out here on the left uh, panel here, these are our various uh, tabs for different functions in Napled Sim. The first four are various simulation configurations. So a, a single simulation, um, a population simulation or, or sim pops, um, a run list, which is a, a batch run of simulations and a parameter sweep. And the, the latter three panels here are customizations you can add to simulations. So a cohort would, would be a new uh, patient population. Your output is deciding what variables you want to save. And then your specified data is um, you can input um, time series for state data, um, in particular for uh, drug PK data that then the model can consume and use when it runs. So I'm going to focus mostly on sim single and sim pops. I'll start with a sim single because um, that is the you need a base sim single to run any other application. So sim pops and, and sweeps need a base sim single. Uh, when you start a new sim single, uh, you'll have a set, uh, various sets of parameters to choose from. So species, drug, calorie, and time parameters. These are uh, various options within each of these sections. So if you click on this tile, you get all the possible choices for parameters in that group. You can choose, again, customize initial conditions, your solver options, if you create specified data using, again, this tab here, it'll show up here as an option. And then your output panel is, again, what variables are you going to save? You also can create new custom parameter sets in the GUI. So if you click on um, this button here, again, for each of these panels, I'll do the time one because it's fairly small. Um, these are the current values of the time parameters and you can update these and make a new set. Uh, you can look at it in this customizer customizer view or a table view. If you've used MATLAB, uh, the MATLAB V2A version, this probably looks a little more familiar. Uh, but you can, let's say we want to customize the simulation time. We can do 30 hours instead of 24, and we can save this as a new custom parameter set that will be applied to our, our simulation, and it updates automatically right here. So I'm going to move on to the, so we could run this standalone um, just with this play button right here, but uh, let's do a, a population simulation to see uh, kind of some of the, the speed that's offered with Julia. So when you create a sim pops, you need to select a base sim single. And if you have multiple sim singles you've made, then you can choose which one. We just have the one right now. You want to choose your population. We're going to choose a relatively small one. So we'll do a 16 patient population. And we'll just choose to save the state variables to keep this a little bit smaller on the memory side. You can choose how many processes to use. Uh, let's do four for now. And so what's going to happen is uh, the base parameters will be applied to every simulation. And then this list of variables, these are going to vary for all the patients in the SimPops. Uh, so they, they will override what's in the base sim, uh, the base sim single. So that all looks good and we can click the start button. That's gonna pull up the SimPop simulation GUI. So each of these tiles corresponds to one of the patients. We've got just some so system status up here showing uh, you know, memory usage, disk space, and our output format, uh, this is important. 
you can output the results as a results database, which is a SQ light file or as an Excel file. If you want to use the result viewer GUI, you need to save a results database. Um, Excel file uh, can't be consumed by the results viewer. So if you do want to use this results GUI, make sure you either save results database or save both. Uh, we'll just do the database for now. So I'll start this simulation and it's going to initialize for a few moments. And while it's initializing, this is when control is passed from the C++ GUI to the Julia backend. And while it's doing this, um, I'll point out, so this is, right now it's compiling the equations. So this is an example of one of our equation files. I chose a pretty small one, uh, but all of our model equations are split into um, submodels. So this is like the, this is the caloric intake submodel. Each submodel has an algebraics function and a differentials function. And one of the nice things about Julia is that uh, you, you have support for labeled structures. So this is our, for instance, this denaffled variable is our derivative structure. And instead of indexing it like denaffled index 100 and having to map out what does that correspond to, we can directly label, you know, what this core, th this is the meal calories. And that makes things a little bit easier. And there is no, um, there's, there's no performance hit there. It's optimized where it's the same thing as indexing an array. So this is how you would then go about editing equations that could then be used in the model. So we check back in on the SimPops. You see the first four simulations have started. Um, we've got a status here, four are running, 12 are, are in the queue. And now they're being saved. So they'll turn green when they finished. If you click on these patient tiles, you can look at more information about them. Uh, we've got, you can see which parameters were used for the patients. You see what initial conditions were applied to the patients. And that's just a way to confirm that all the data you passed in was in fact uh, parsed correctly. And there's a patient log that shows various events. So our first patient, um, logged out events. And so you can see we got to 30 hours. So our, our time parameter override did in fact work. And an interesting thing here is we, uh, this toggle button will show us uh, elapsed time for each simulation. And I want to point out the difference in simulation time for the first simulation on a process versus the, the subsequent simulations. So again, the first simulation is longer that's because the equations are being compiled and you know Julia is kind of collecting all the code it needs to specialize on on this run once all that code's compiled it starts going very quickly and so what this shows is that for a single simulation you're going to get this compilation hit you know every single time but if you're running large population simulations you know perhaps hundreds maybe even a thousand patients uh, you're going to see very, very rapid simulation time compared to MATLAB because once that compile time hit happens, everything else is much, much faster. Um, so that's end of the simulation. They all finished successfully. Um, just to point out uh, this workspace, this will pull up information about your simulation. So here's our results file and our various patient logs that are uh, consumed by the GUI. Um, but let's check out the results. So clicking the results button, that's going to pull up the results viewer. So it's consuming that results database that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you can filter through. We have 635 available variables. That's all the state variables. All right, so you can plot out the plasma glucose for all of our patients. You can customize these charts, the background, foreground color, font. Um, and you can view multiple tables or charts at once. So right now we have a single chart. We can change this to be a, uh, look at four charts at once. So we can load in more data to view it. And these are kind of small, so you can, um, you can change the view, give yourself a little more space, look at these plots. And you can export these plots and also the data tables. There's a chart view and a data view that shows the, again, the data as a table. 
So you can save or copy the chart, the data table uh, with these buttons down here, or with these uh, overall save features, this will save all of the currently active plots. So this could, right now, this would save both tables and this would save both charts versus just one or the other. So I think I'm running a little bit short on time here. What I will point out is that, uh, let's say you are done the simulation and you've closed everything out and then you want to go back and look at your simulation results from a previous run. Um, we have a way to open previous results. So this option, we can look at our workspace. This is the only simulation we have active. And this will pop up the exact same view that we just had. Um, you also might find yourself in a position where you want to um, either plot out fewer variables or look at a very specific time frame. Uh, you don't you don't need that whole uh, results view that we just had. You also can take an existing results file and export a subset of variables and a subset of times if you want. So you can customize a time range. So let's just say we want to do we'll do ten hours. And you can add individual variables to export, or you can choose them from an existing uh, list of variables. We'll just choose our kind of our baseline patient variables here. So this is going to be our list of variables that we extract from our current results file. We can put these in a CSV, we can put them in another results database, or we can save them and then directly open up another results viewer. So we'll do that. It might take just a moment here as it writes that database. So now we have 36 variables, not all 635. And if we look at the plasma glucose, now we just have the first 10 hours for every patient. Um, so you've got a lot of flexibility with how you interact with your, with your simulation results. And uh, yeah, so I think that's probably the, all the time we have. Um, we can, like to go into more detail, you know, later time about uh, some of the sweeps and and various other buttons over here. But I think that's that's all we have for now. So I'll pass control back to Brett. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, it's an excellent demonstration. Yeah, I think we hopefully really gave our audience a feel for how nice that new interface is, and also how nicely organized those equations are. Um, I think it's a big uh, step forward. So. Before we get into some sort of a question and answer uh, discussion period, let's go to Corey Barry, uh, senior software engineer and really the architect of that interface that Matt just showed. Um, Corey, you know, why was the QTC++ infrastructure chosen for the new NAFLD SIM interface implementation? So I think the QT interface itself, the QT libraries offer a more professional look, um, a streamlined look. It's also much easier to deploy on multiple operating systems um, than some of the other toolkits. Um, it's one of the best toolkits for C++ and GUI development. And it also offers a much sleeker look. It allows you to customize all the little widgets and controls that you have on the, um, within the, the application with uh, sort of a, a small, uh, uh, lower version of CSS style sheets, uh, which allows you to just make any kind of designs that you want. So we just wanted all that customization power and ability to make it look a lot better. Um, and also get the ability to deploy it on multiple platforms that support QT. Awesome. So based on that last response, are you saying that we can use this new Naffleton version on multiple operating systems rather than just Windows like the current uh, version? 2A is supported? Yes, so we can, QT supports a multitude of platforms and there's nothing in our code that limits us from supporting those platforms. And also, I think we've, we've also done testing on Linux. Uh, it should have a Linux version as well. Um, and there's also potential to have it working on uh, Mac OS or uh, any other platform, even ARM-based uh, platforms because QT supports all those. So. We kind of designed it from the beginning to be open-minded to what kind of platforms and or, or even CPU models we want to support for the application. Great, uh, that's great news. Um, well, I know that this new interface supports 
both our DSX uh, liver safety platform and this new NAFLD SIM design. What was the hardest aspect of the development of this new interface in, in, in general, applicable sort of to both versions? What was the hardest aspect or the biggest challenge? So a, a much a, a lot of the um, low level work for the interface was already done for um, a Dilly SIM. And so I think a, a lot of the work, though, for this interface in particular was done by Matt. Um, so I think he did a, a great job of getting that interface done. And so for me personally, I, I would go back to initially creating a Dillison interface, which is what, like the baseline um, first gen model of this uh, interface and getting that into a steady state. And once that was ready and I had the pieces in place to add more applications on top to use this interface, I think it was, it became a lot easier. Um, but yeah, a lot of the work for the NEFLS SIM interface in particular, I have to go to Matt for that. <laughs> he did a great job on it. Awesome. Well, as an experienced software engineer who's worked on lots of different types of projects, would you say that the NEFLS SIM project, um, and I guess parallel to that, you know, the DSX project, because it's a similar kind of process, was was the process of creating this new interface and connecting it up to the, in this case in particular, the Julia backend, a, a large scale project or a small project, just in relative terms, in terms of an engineering uh, software project? I would say it was, and from my perspective, I think it's a large project because it was, we had to basically do two things at once. We had to implement the ability to connect more applications with, into the interface. And also at the same time, implement a new system with Julia, a new model um, within Julia and hope both of those work and came together at the same time, which it thankfully did. So, I mean, that in itself, I think was a, was a, a great feat um, to get that working. And so, and that's more so than even DSX. DSX was mostly all C++, but in this case here, we have Julia to contend with, we have to interface it together. We have to, we had to put things in place to make room for uh, now for SIM and other tools in the future as well. So I would call it a much larger project. Gotcha. Well, we've seen this interface now um, be applied to DSX, as we've said. And as you said, uh, with Matt's hard work, we've seen it get connected to NAFLSIM as well. Corey, do you see the ability in the future for us to apply it to other QSP models, QST models like Renus and IPF and MILD some other things that we have um, in our in our uh, basket of of tools. Um, is that possible in the future? Oh, definitely. Now we have the system in place to connect multiple applications. I mean, anything is possible. As a matter of fact, we actually uh, did test an internal version of IPF sim connected with the same UI. So it's you know, it's really opened the doors to, you know, being able to create any kind of model and just connect the nice uh, C++ based, QT based UI on top of it and kind of get these same kind of results. So, yeah, I think I think the future is looking pretty nice for that. Great. Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate your perspectives there. Um, all right. Well, I think we have a bit of time left for some question and answer discussion. And I just want to encourage the audience uh, while we're going through the Q&A. If you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom interface, and we will get to those here in the discussion. So um, let's start with one question that's come in, and I'm going to start with you, Matt, on this, but I'm then going to let you kick it over to Scott for his perspective as well on this. Um, you know, given that we've tested the beta version internally, we continue to test the beta version. Um, can you give our audience a sense for, and the question really centers around the major um, similarities and differences between V2A and V2B in two areas. One would be sort of simulation um, accuracy, sort of, you know, what, what does the model show? Where have we seen differences or similarities in the results? And then number two, simulation time. What are we seeing in terms of comparisons in what scenarios and just, you know, just rough ideas on, on how they compare speed wise. So accuracy and speed. Sure. So for for accuracy, uh, what we what Scott and I did was we would configure the same simulations, usually large large sim pops, that focused on different aspects of the model. So um, you know, kind of a just a here's what hits the main 
functions. Here's a, here's a simulation that hits more of a specific drug application, trying to hit different submodels. And so he'd run it with MATLAB, I'd run it on the NAPLED sim, Julia. And then uh, we would use a, a, a comparison tool that, uh, that Corey designed to uh, just compare, you know, at, at every time step, what are, what are we seeing between, between MATLAB and Julia? And so there are, there'd be some very, what we got down to is very slight differences that just come down to solver choice. Um, as MATLAB is using, uh, I think, 1.5S and currently for uh, Julia, it, we're using a, the Julia differential equation solver is a wrapper around the, the Sundials um, CV ODE solver. So there are some minute differences, but it's, you know, down to, you know, insignificant digits essentially. And so when we got down that far, you know, we, we said this is a most likely pretty successful. Um, and then in terms of speed, um, we I think we saw, you know, at least five times speed increase um, up to seven times speed increase for some of our large population simulations where we we're running, you know, uh, 100 patients for a three year simulation. Um, so we, we saw a lot of a lot of speed increases. All right, and uh, Scott, anything to add there? Matt did a nice job summarizing it. I think, you know, by design, we have really made, gone through great pains to ensure that the model, the underlying model, Napleton B2B, is generating virtually identical results to Napleton B2A. Again, we have tons of experience at this point with Napleton B2A, and so just switching it over to a new solver, a new software platform, we want to make sure that we're not disturbing that, and we're able to, you know, continue to build on that historical legacy. And we are. It's great. Uh, you know, all the testing we've done thus far, anyways, it's held up quite well. All right. So to summarize, um, pretty darn accurate when you compare one to the other and uh, a lot faster, especially for larger sim pops, most importantly. Um, let's go back to you, Matt, but I would also invite anybody else to contribute after Matt on this one, too. Uh, this is an interesting question. So you got this. This is almost this is like a fun engineering problem here. You've got this upfront cost for mm -hmm. the JIT um, compiler, and then you've got kind of a rapid increase in speed after the initial simulation. So one of the questions that's come in is, is there any hints or sort of interesting tidbits on the best way to select the number of cores to use, given that the more cores you use, the more, you know, the more cores are focused on that initial time versus if you use smaller number, you're kind of running more of the latter sims because you're stacking more than you're spreading. So, um, mm -hmm. so just any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think saying that it's, it's, it's an art is, is definitely true. I don't know that it is going to be identical for every computer. Um, probably depends on how many processes you have available and how much you want to be using your machine while the simulation is running. If you're willing to just sit back and not use it and let all the threads go, uh, you know, that'll give you quite a bit of speed. Um, but you, you do see that the more processes you have, the longer a simulation will take on, on a thread just as, as resources are being alloc allocated. So I, I don't know there's a magic number. Uh, you probably noticed that our default that the GUI pops up is, is just using half the number of processes, and that might be a, a decent starting point. Uh, but it yeah it's just that's something i think that you have to experiment with depending on on what resources you have and i'll just build on that it is a hundred percent dependent on your local computing environment and so uh, you know take it on a desktop take it on a server take it in the cloud that you need to kind of just do a couple three you know pretty basic tests to exactly explore that do you gain and how much efficiency do you gain by running a smaller number, but in series versus a larger number in parallel. And that's really the balance. And there isn't a one size fits all because each machine, each environment is very unique in that way. Yeah, that's great. I, I would just add that, um, I think to, to, to also add to what Matt said about the, the default selections, one of the things that we do generally advise, and again, it, 
everything Matt and Scott said, it's very custom. It, it involves some testing. It involves your system. But one of the things that we've generally tried to avoid, a lot of processors nowadays are hyper-threaded and they have two threads for one core. So you may have a, a processor that has, you know, 16 true nodes, but, the, but those split into 32 hyper-threads. And so the reason we default to half is we do not advise splitting into the hyper thread. So if you've got 16 cores, stick to 16 simulations and it kind of gets back to what Matt said. And we saw this with some of the other engineering backends is that when you split a core into two for the hyper threads, you don't necessarily get a 2x speed up, but you do get slowdowns in the processors trying to deal with that many um, threads. So that's just a general rule of thumb. That's why it's, it's set to half. Um, many, many processors are hyper threaded now. So um, just a couple of thoughts there. All right, uh, we got a couple more questions. Um, can a user access the code under the hood and modify it? For example, can they modify the bespoke model and add or take away components? I'll just throw this out. Hey, Francisco, do you happen to have any experience having done this at all? <laughs> yeah, actually I do. So um, <laughs> once you actually have the v2b beta installed the code is all um set aside away in different um julia files that are um as matt showed you know the color he had showed the caloric intake module um you can add new modules for your own equations and your own treatments um and that, that's a good way to at least you know it, it separates each individual component of the entire you know nap qsp um system itself um so yeah you can you know once you have it installed you can update the code and modify it as needed um or you know to that extent even you know play around okay with which modules can you change parameter values and necessarily you know mimic churning off that specific signal um getting down to the minimal model or you know, more complex model that you're desiring I think it's very clear. Um, Matt, let me go to you for a practical question. So a new user installs the software. What's the licensing process look like to get activated? Let me, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen again real fast so I can kind of show what this looks like. Sure. Um, so when you when you launch Naffold Sim, uh, this this is my view currently right now so it shows that my license is active we're not able user. to see your your screen yet matt here, here goes. I to, okay i had to click the okay button that's a big thing okay. <laughs> um, so when you open naffold sim you get taken to a license view and so my license is currently active for you know 84 more days when you first launch naffold sim you'll be brought to the screen and there'll be another button here saying um you know, generate host id so what you'll do is you will click that host ID, generate host ID button, um, and then you'll you know send the host ID, send that ID to us with a re request for a license. Uh, we return a license file, and then again there'll be a button here that says import license. You'll point Naffold send towards that license file, and then you'll be you'll be good to go, and it'll automatically import the license each time you open Naffold Sim from from then on out. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I think it's very clear. Send us the host ID generated. And to be to be clear, it's a specific host ID generated by this particular platform. So you do have to send that um, directly to us. Um, Matt, another question for you. You know, in version 2A and in DillySim, as an example, and some of our other MATLAB platforms, when we run a SimPops, um, that sim pops if you if you get a power outage in the middle of that simulation it's it's a big deal with this version can you clarify for our users are the results for each step in the sim pops each group of virtual patients um, in other words per set are they saved as they go or are they all saved at the end you got to make it to the end to you know cross your fingers they are so they are saved as you go um what we what we have is a when a sim pops is running, there's essentially a, a a dedicated listening process that is just monitoring for new patient results. So each patient writes out a, its own results database file or its own results CSV file, and then when this listener 
detects that new file, it appends it to the overall results file. Now those, those individual results files are transient, so right? they're removed once they are added to the overall results file. But if in that case you're describing where there's you know, an outage or the simulation stops, you will have a results file with everything saved up to that event, essentially. Awesome. All right, let's go over to Scott. Um, Scott, this next question in from the audience is a little bit broad. So, you know, you, you have to work sort of in the, this is a long, could be a long question. So to be concise here, but could you please explain how the QSP model was built originally, the underlying model itself of Naffold and Nash? So you're saying we've got another two hours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I mean, we adhered to the same process that, you know, uh, stood the test of time, right? You know, how did Guyton build the, the circulation QSP model? We followed literally the same process. And so you do that by kind of biting off small chunks and building the functionality. And by small chunks, I mean the submodels. Uh, you know, the, I showed you in the diagram, the steatosis, the lipotoxicity, the inflammation the fibrosis. There are, of course, more details than in that diagram, but really, it, you know, you start with initial focus on each of those separately, whilst acknowledging that they are not separate. And so then the next layer after that kind of construction of calibration, understanding the, the biochemistry, the pathophysiology for that section is how those sections interact. And, you know, that's really, I think, the, the great beauty of QSP modeling is the interaction. You know, how does one process affect another and how does the whole thing come together? And the, the next layer, and this is, you know, most metabolic diseases and certainly NASH is one, there isn't a representative patient. There are numerous patients. Everybody, it seems, has different pathophysiologic and or uh, clinical characteristics. And so, again, you have to, in your design and in your parameterization, account for that diversity of ranges. And that's where our sim simulated population comes into play. And so all of our calibration and validation at the end really is not focused on a single patient uh, in, in, you know, really validating model performance. Rather, it's the panoply of 1,717 different patients across the physiolog pathophysiologic spectrum that enable us to have the confidence that the, the validation was done successfully. The final step, thanks for your patience, Brett. The final step is to simulate as many treatments as possible. The standard edict is standard of care. You simulate that in this field. There aren't any medicines available to treat uh, in two patients. Weight loss is the standard of care. And we've, as you saw in some of the slides we've shown earlier, have simulated treatments in development um, that have available clinical data. So step by step, you know, increasing the scope as you go, building on the work that you've done before. Great. Well, we're going to stay with you, Scott. We have one more question here. Do you offer annual licenses to the platform? We do. We definitely do. Uh, but only just now are we offering licenses to Nappleton B2B, the Julia version. Um, we have had a, a good, nice success rate of licensing uh, Nappleton uh, B2A. A number of users, and you know, we have training protocols, we have training documentation, we have a, a great deal of information at the ready. Um, and I would encourage you know others to explore this. Um, oftentimes, you know, you're probably aware we're also a services organization. So I think one of the most successful, if you're bringing something in house the first time, is what I call the learn one, do one, teach one. So you know, gain a license to the software. Also have our services team conducted the initial project whilst training the in-house team as to how it's done, the nuances of the model so that they can take that work and build on it, the next project conducted in-house. So learn one, do one, teach one. Great. Yeah. And just to add to that, you know, we get, usually we get these licensing questions in bunches. So in case for those who may be wondering, yes, we do also offer perpetual licenses, although there are caveats on how long you get updates and upgrades and things like that included. Um, we also have a license option that allows you to scale to cluster, you know, virtual, uh, you know, um, a grid as well up from, you know, one single machine to many, many, many nodes. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't scale linearly. So it's a flat fee and you get to scale to infinity there. So we have a, a licensing option for that. 
um, as well. Um, so I think Scott, one more question for you. Um, are there any particularly high impact cases of NAFLD sim use that have been disclosed via posters or publications or things like that, that um, our readers could go to the resource center, for example, at simulations-plus.com and check out any ones that you would want to highlight? This is the equivalent of saying, do you have a favorite child, Brett? <laughs> I love them all equally. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, we've uh, most recently at the liver meeting, um, so sponsored by the American Association for the Society of Liver Diseases, um, we presented three posters and they're, 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 they were received very well. One was focused on uh, something to which I alluded earlier, which is there's this um, kind of unusual, if you will, uh, frequency of positive responses in the placebo group, an unusually high response rate amongst patients who are not actually treated. And what could be some of those mechanistic uh, explanations for that? Uh, some of our simulations um, indicated that uh, alcohol intake and kind of the modulation thereof could be contributing. So that was, I think, one, like I said, that was received quite well. Also in that same meeting, um, we did uh, head to head to head to head, four different compounds in the same class comparison of predicted efficacy um, using kind of the classic QSP modeling uh, approach. And again, that one was as well received very, very well. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we've uh, we've talked through a lot today. We've seen the new platform in action. I want to thank um, Scott, Corey, Francisco, Matt for joining me today and talking through this and giving us your time, guys. Um, you know, we're excited about the improvements in health that we're going to see in the NAFLD and NASH space with this new platform. And the number one thing to us always is seeing those patients get treated and get benefit. And I think we're going to see that in the long run through this new technology. So appreciate you guys joining me today. Jasmine, I want to turn it back to you to, to uh, wrap us up and close us out. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, for any questions we didn't get to, our BD team uh, will reach out to you with answers. We invite you to learn more about NAFLSTIM or our other products on our website. Um, the Resource Center is also available with a bunch of free uh, resources you can check out. This webinar has been recorded for playback and will be available on our website and YouTube channel. This concludes our webinar for today. Again, thank you everyone for joining us.